and welcome to Old Reiki Retold the Podcast. I'm Gabriella, one of the collections assistants involved in an exciting project Museums and Galleries Edinburgh are embarking on looking into our entire collection. During this process we've been pulling out amazing stories that have been hidden inside our collections just waiting to be told. Currently, however, we're unable to access our collections in person due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but luckily we can access our collections database from home. These bite-sized podcasts will be conversations, interviews, and just general good chat that will tell you a little bit more about the amazing stories behind Edinburgh, our old Ricky. Welcome to our second podcast, which takes a look at the three giants of Scottish literature, Walter Scott, Robert Louis Stevenson, and Robert Burns, who are celebrated in the Writers' Museum on the Royal Mile and have been immortalised in monuments across the city along with their beloved dogs, similar to Bobby from our first podcast all in the care of Museums and Galleries Edinburgh. Oliver, our fellow collections assistant, will introduce us to three writers and we'll take a look at the interesting collection objects we've unearthed to tell the stories of these three iconic writers. Okay, so in this podcast we're going to talk about the three writers represented in the Writers Museum and their dogs. Let's start with Sir Walter Scott. So, born 15th of August 1771 in a third floor apartment on College Wind in the old town of Edinburgh. Died 21st of September 1832, age 61, the oldest living writer that we're going to cover today, but did die during a typhus pandemic in Scotland. Probably best known as the famous Scottish novelist, poet, playwright and historian. Best known works are probably Waverley, Ivanhoe and Rob Roy. It seems like all the writers that we're going to cover today had poor health during their life as well, as he suffered a bout of polio as a child, which left him lame throughout his life. Um, his parents sent him to the Scottish borders to live with his paternal grandparents to try out a water cure, which didn't really work. Well, how do we know? I mean, from what I heard, the cure sounds absolutely mad, but <laughs> he had a really good time when he was living in the borders. Well, he, yes, he did. Yeah. Um, he loved all of the local tales and the speech patterns of the people who lived in the Scottish borders. He loved the local tales so much so that he would carve into twigs the stories that he'd heard to avoid disapproval for those who believe that the stories should never be written down or in fact printed. Well, so instead of writing down his stories as a boy, he just made little figures of them instead? Well, apparently, yeah, he would carve them into twigs. Now, my idea of a twig is that it's a tiny spindly thing. How do you get a, ho a whole folk tale in that twig? Unless he has numerous twigs. And I don't know how speedy he was at carving, but how do you carve a whole thing in twigs? Well, I mean, he was a very detailed author. I mean, I'm going to put it out there. It's, it's a hard slog, and I imagine... Yeah. Looking at any of his twigs, it would be some hard work trying to work out what on earth he was doing with them. Well, yeah, and what if you get the order of those twigs mixed up and you're just making it up as you go along when you come back to it to write it down? He must have had some very unusual way of uh, recording it on the twigs. He must have, yes. Suffice to say. I wouldn't say the twigs have survived. I don't think we do have any twigs in the collection from Walter Scott. I mean, if we did, they would be on pride of place in the Writers' Museum, I can tell you. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they'd be a very interesting object to look at, but I don't think they will have survived. And maybe we should take this story as with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Perhaps. But I like it nonetheless. Yes. We do have, of course, many items associated with Walter Scott in the collection. We have the printing press. His famous Waverly novels were printed on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, we have an ink pot associated with Scott that he was said to use when he was writing his novels. One quite remarkable thing we have is a rocking horse. Yeah, we do at the writers, which is on display. And it was found in the attic of 25 George Square, where Scott lived until his marriage. And the interesting thing about the rocking horse is that it's tilted because Scott had polio, which he contracted as a child, and so it was made for him. And, as well as the Robin Gorse, in the collection we have legal papers belonging to Scott's father, which were weirdly found stuffed into a pad on the seat to act as a cushion. To be stuffed into a cushion, yeah. yeah. Wouldn't normally keep those in my rocking horse. No, not a place that I would have thought to stuff my legal documents. Not that I have very, very many rocking horses. I mean, I wish I did. Would be a nice thing to go see once everything is lifted. But, of course, we do have some of his hair in a sealed envelope. Of course. Because a museum wouldn't be complete without some of a famous person's hair no. in a sealed envelope. No, no. We can use that later. If you want... Make another Scott. <laughs> if we want more and more very long novels, then that's 
what we need to do. Karusha, you would have seen the most important item we have about Walter Scott in the Museum Collection Centre. Oh yes. Pride, Pride of place, place, it is definitely. a replica of the Scott Monument made out of wooden chip forks. Being Edinburgh, and we love chips. Yeah. Salt and sauce? There isn't, I don't think there's any salt and sauce on the monument. It doesn't smell, anyway, and that's the crucial thing. That is good. There's no chip shop smell. Well, I mean, I haven't smelled it recently. It's been a long time. But the chip fork model is, of course, a representation of the Scott Monument on Princess Street, which it kind of resembles a massive gothic spaceship in the centre of the city. And it's one of the few monuments to a author you'll find. Se second largest monument to a writer in the whole world as well. Following the death of Scott, there was a competition held to design a monument for Scott, which was won by George Meikle Kemp, but under the pseudonym at the time of John Morvo. And construction began on that in 1841. And it wasn't until... 12 years after Scott's death that it was inaugurated, one might say, opened to the public. Um, but of course, George Meikle Kemp wasn't there because sadly he'd fallen into the Union Canal and drowned. It would have been nice if he'd seen it, nonetheless. I mean, but saying that, the sculptor of Scott and Maida saw it finished, obviously, because he did it. Yeah, John Steele. John Steele, and he was the sculptor for Queen Victoria. In fact, he even sculpted the statue of Queen Victoria on top of the Royal Scottish Academy, which is just a stone's throw away from the Scots Monument. He was very well known, very famous, and very successful, and an Edinburgh man as well. He even created the first foundry in Edinburgh to cast the Duke of Wellington statue, which is nearby the Scott Monument. Oh wow, I did not know that. Yeah, he was a very busy guy. <laughs> and of course, John Steele's brother was, I'm going to say this wrong too, Gurley Steele, who created many likenesses of Bobby, our dog Bobby, holding really? back our first po podcast. There's a link. Yeah. It's quite an illustrious family. It's, I think John Steele's father was quite well known as well. Yes. He was known as John Steele Jr. for a lot of his mm. career in the early days because of his father and his fame as a sculptor. Mm -hmm. Going back to that sculpture that we have in the collection, that huge sculpture in the Scott Monument, I just wanted to share some quite astounding facts about that. So the sculpture took, well there's some debate, but I'm going on the website for the Edinburgh Museum and Galleries, and it took six years. I'd say, yeah, I'd say six years was still a decent amount of time to create that. Well, it is 30 tons, and that's just the sculpture itself is, is one, one piece of Carrara marble weighing 30 tons. He liked to depict his sculptures in a classical style, and you'll see that in a lot of his work. So with the sculpture of Scott, his robes, although his robes are contemporary, they're kind of what Scott would have been wearing, but they flow in a way which harks back to ancient times in the, how it's all sculpted and how it all comes together. And he was very flattering with his sculptures as well. He liked to show people off and make sure that the uh, would actually appreciate their work afterwards. I mean, that's what you want if you're going to have a sculpture of yourself. You want it flattering, don't you? Oh, absolutely. The most important thing about the Scott Monument, I suppose, is that it represents Scott's dog, Maida. Oh yes, and we love a dog. We love a dog. We love a dog, not just at Museums Gallery Edinburgh, but across Edinburgh as a whole. We love a dog. What do we know about Maida? What's, uh, what's Maida's game? <laughs> Maida was the beloved dog of Scott and can be found in a lot of the portraits of Walter Scott. Maida was a cross between a Pyrenean wolf dog and a Highland deerhound, so pretty big. And from the statue, you can tell that they've stood quite tall. Called Maida after the Battle of Maida in 1806, outside of a town called Maida in Calabria, Italy, during the Napoleonic War. So there's a story that Maida would lie in his study with his head in reach of Scott's hand and when he wanted to leave, he would knock his tail against the door to let Scott know that he wanted to escape. I didn't know that. What I read about Maida uh -huh. was that, well, you might know that Scott was one of the most painted men of all time. Yes, yes. And he was constantly being painted by different people and his dog got absolutely sick of this. Yeah, and rightly so. I mean, painting takes a long time. Yeah. And so there was a case of when a new painter would enter a room and unfurl his or her brushes. Maida would see the brushes and just walk off because he could not be bothered with sitting around. Fair enough. I think I would get a bit bored. And when you do see pictures of Scott with his dogs, which we do have in the Writers Museum, the dogs do look pretty bored. <laughs> a bit annoyed at the situation. If a dog's bored, you can tell, and yeah, they're not going to hide exactly. it. Exactly. 
There is, of course, a stone monument to Maida as well outside of their estate in Melrose because he was so loved. And it reads, Beneath the sculpted form which late you bore, sleep soundly Maida at your master's door. Oh, that's nice. Did he write that? Yeah, he did. Oh, well, yeah. Maida, well, as you mentioned, Maida was an absolutely enormous dog. But did you know that people would mistake Maida for some escaped beast from the zoo? Oh, really? When they saw her, well, him, sorry, in the woods wow. about Scott's house. And I read that they would see Maida's footprints in Ettrick Forest nearby Scott's estate. And they would just think that the, the zoo has come to town and it's gone loose, basically. Oh my goodness. There was even tales of when Scott would, he would travel everywhere with Maida and when he'd turn up, there'd be crowds gathered around, not really to see Scott, sometimes just to see his dog because they're amazed at the size yeah, of the thing. fair enough. So he loved the big dog. I'd just, I'd turn up for the dog too. I would definitely turn up for the dog. Yeah, she was quite famous in her own right. Um, there's a story that one of Scott's friends was on a trip to Munich and found a little snuff box with her likeness on the front um, and confirmed it was Maida with the inscription that read the loving dog of Walter Scott. Oh. So people did love Maida separately to Scott. If only Maida wrote a few books in his time yeah. and he'd be maybe more famous than Scott. Of course, Maida wasn't Scott's only dog. That is very true. We know of at least, well, I know of two other dogs who I would regard as personally cuter they made her. Oh, yes. Yep. Scott had two absolutely adorable tiny dogs. With their names, it kind of shows that Scott would have definitely been a fan of the Spice Girls. Yes, I see that. Because his dogs were called Ginger and Spice. He would have been a fan of the Spice Girls. Um, so there is a painting of two of Scott's tiny dogs in the National Gallery, I think. And these are two Dandy Dimont Terriers. And Scott read these terriers and he just handed them out to all his friends and he wrote about them in his diaries and he was very fond of them and it kind of just shows that Scott was a massive dog fan. Today, um, any existing Dandy Dinmont can be traced back to Scott's original dogs. Yeah, yeah. He was the original breeder of the mm -hmm. Dandy Dinmont Terrier. He also had a Highland Terrier called, I'm going to get this name wrong, it's a very unusual name, called Urisk. That might be how you pronounce it. Quite possibly. Which is named named after a Highland satyr, so like a Highland demon, woodland creature in mythology. Cool. The more you know. Definitely. About Scott and his dogs. He was very very fond of Scotland. Scott is also commemorated in the Macar's Court outside the Rogers Museum with a quote inscribed in the paving slab that reads, This is my own, my native land. That can't be denied. So another of the writers celebrated in the Writers' Museum is, of course, Robert Louis Stevenson, born 13th of November at 8 Howard Place in Edinburgh and died 3rd of December 1894 in Samoa, funnily enough, at the age of 44, so pretty young. Um, possibly most famous for writing Treasure Island, The Strange Case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde, and Kidnapped. And out of those books, which is your favourite book? Probably Kidnapped. I think I'd agree as well. Mm. I think I like Kidnapped because it does feature loads and loads about Scotland and Edinburgh. Yeah, I think that's why I like it as well, because I can visit the places that are in it very locally. It's the easiest to read. Mm. I find with Jack and Hyde, it just gets really weird at times and a bit dark. Mm -hmm. But that's my preference. Of course, in the collection, we've got loads of stuff about Stevenson. I had a look. A lot, a lot of stuff. It's more than, okay, it's more than 2,000, so take a guess. Random number 237. You're not far off. It's 2,284 items just associated with Stevenson in the collection. It's quite incredible. Just to pick a few choice examples. We have loads of his letters, which he wrote from Samoa towards the end of his life. Mm -hmm. And we also have his fishing rod. Oh, interesting. I didn't know he was an avid fisher. He was quite outdoorsy. Yeah. Yeah. Golfing, fishing, and... Well, I mean, he enjoyed going going travelling, of course. So, yeah, he did yes, enjoy the outdoors. Yes, he did. Continuing the trend we had from Scott, we also have some of his hair as well, because... What is it about hair? People love to collect hair. He did have quite long hair as well, didn't he? He was quite the bohemian yes. in his life. Yeah. I was going to use that word. I was reading that he loved, he was a, as a Francophile, he loved to emulate the French. I see, yeah. Also, his favourite outfit was a velvet smoking jacket. 
which yep. he wore about town like quite the well i should say bohemian just a man about town that was his thing yeah i mean there is the the one image that you think of when you think of stevenson is the long hair in the velvet jacket with the with the tie he does look quite bohemian but also quite skinny apparently for his time he was never ever above nine stone yeah he was quite lanky yeah, but he was. quite skinny yeah. and it's it's really continuing that trend we have with the writers and represented in the museum that none of them were very healthy no i know yeah dying at the age, suddenly dying at the age of 44 but he did have sort of coughs and fevers throughout his life which ex possibly is a reason for all of his travels he would always want to escape to warmer climates which would help with his health yeah he was always trying to get away he realized that scotland wasn't healthy for him whatsoever no as and especially in victorian times i don't think that call was doing anyone any good and of course it was on holiday in bournemouth where he wrote the strange case of dr jekyll and mr hyde and the famous character mr paul is named after the town of Poole near Bournemouth. Oh, is it? Yes, yeah, and he would obviously very inspired by the places that he visited in his writings. Oh, wasn't it Jack on Hyde which he wrote in about six days? Quite possibly, yes. Yeah. Did you mention that it was also under the influence of quite heavy drugs as well? Uh, yeah, there's some rumours that he was quite into his drugs. Of course, this was at a time when you could just buy quite heavy drugs here, there uh -huh. and everywhere over the counter. Uh-huh. But there are some rumours that he wasn't quite a cocaine vendor when he did his writing. I wonder what his work would have been like without the drugs. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that. His wife read the first edit of his Jack and Hyde book and she thought it was a bit, a bit pants, a bit odd. Oh. And so he just shoved it on the fire and then oh. rewrote it all in some say a matter of days, some say just a few weeks, but still incredibly fast. But yeah, that is quite incredible. I don't think I would be able to write a novel within no. six days, or maybe even six years. I don't think I could ever write a novel. Just, no. just shows. Stevenson knew no. what he was doing. Yes, that's why he's one of the greats. Yeah, I mean, he did like getting into trouble as well. Did he? Well, he did get into I don't know if he liked it. He definitely got into trouble a few times. On one particular occasion, he was given a criminal conviction because he was doing one of the most heinous crimes imaginable. He was oh. um, he was throwing snowballs at students when he was also a student at Edinburgh oh. University, and oh he was convicted. I mean, what? He, he wasn't sent. I mean, he wasn't sent down to prison, but he was given a criminal conviction, as you would expect. Quite possibly. I mean, that sounds very harsh to me. Not, not to me. I'd... No. <laughs> Stevenson was asking for it. <laughs> Don't mess with those snowballs. But of course, he loved his dogs. Stevenson was a massive dog fan. And he was even even famous for saying, you think those dogs will not be in heaven? I tell you, they will be there long before any of us. Yes, he was. And also a fun fact that that was the inspiration for the title of the film, All Dogs Go to Heaven. The animation from 1989, which I remember watching as a child. I'll give it a watch. Um, I've got a lot of time at the moment. I don't know much about his dog, actually. I know that it was a Sky Terrier. Like Bobby? Famous, yes, like one of the, one of the supposed Bobbies, um, called Kalin, which is a mountain range in Sky. But that's all I know of his dogs. But we do, there is a statue of him with his dog in the city. Like there's a statue of Scott with his dog in the city as well. There is indeed, right by the Collington Parish Church, which is where his grandfather was a minister. Yes, so he spent a lot of time in Collington when he was growing up in Edinburgh as a boy. Yeah. Often with his dog, um, Kilgan, as well. Yeah. So that's why this statue was, well, it was commissioned so that they could commemorate Stevenson's time in Collington, celebrate his life as a writer, and celebrate the time he had with his dog because obviously the dog is the most important aspect of the statue. Well, isn't it just? And the statue, of course, was completed just before the Robert Louis Stevenson Day of that year, which is, of course, 13th of November, day of his birth. And the statue was opened to the public by, of course, another or famous author, Ian Rankin. Famous Edinburgh author, very yep. well known. Also yep. a student of the university, Edinburgh University, as Stevenson was a student. So there's mm -hmm. quite a few links there. And Ian Rankin's a massive fan of Stevenson's writings. He is indeed. He so, is indeed. 
quite an honour to unveil that statue. Almost 300 local people turned out for the street party of the for the unveiling. I would have been down there with my Stevenson costume. Velvet jacket. Velvet jacket and a Sky Terrier in my hand. If only I'd known at the time. Maybe a wig to get some long hair in. Maybe a wig to... I don't have the luscious locks that Stevenson has. Maybe at the end of lockdown. Maybe, yes, maybe at the end of lockdown, everyone will have luscious locks. Yes. As we mentioned earlier on, Stevenson loved to travel. And when he travelled, he always took his dogs with him. He did, indeed. What I do know about his dog after Coolan, the dog who he took on his travels with him, this dog was also a Sky Terrier, because he loves Sky Terriers. Uh-huh. And his dog weirdly was named after his friend, uh, Sir Walter Simpson. So he loved his friend so much, he thought, I'm going to name my favourite dog after you. And then he gave it all sorts of different names. Sometimes he called the dog Wattie. Uh-huh. Then sometime Woggin, Bobbin, Bogey, and various other names. Whatever took his fancy that day, it seems. Pretty much. He was all, quite often he wrote about his dog, and his dog went everywhere with him. I did also find another very unusual letter about some of his dogs when he was a child. And it's it's odd because he's obviously very fond of his dog. But in this circumstance, he's saying, writing to a friend, and he says, Dear Miss Middleton, your letter has been like drawing up of a curtain. Of course, I remember you very well, and the Sky Terrier to which you refer. A heavy, dull, fatted, graceless creature he grew up to be. And he was my own particular pet. Hmm. Heavy, dull, and fatted. And graceless. But he loved him. Ah, you can tell? I think you can tell. <laughs> um, he does seem to go on about him rather a lot. Okay. And apparently this dog was stolen when he was small and kept away from his house for a while. And then he came back and Stevenson was overjoyed. So maybe it took just a week away from the dog. Maybe. Stevenson to appreciate that. Was the dog just as fatted when he came back? I don't think so. No, <laughs> I think in his writing it does say Stevenson's dog was not as fatted. What do we know about Stevenson's time in Samoa? What was going on down there? So he settled in Samoa in 1890 and they seemed to really love him in Samoa. He took the name Tusitala, which was a local Samoan name for teller of tales. But unfortunately, he was only there for about four years when he suddenly collapsed and died from what is now believed to be a cerebral hemorrhage. And in his death, his um, epigraph on his tombstone was translated into a Samoan song of grief. So very much loved. On the... I did read that he was supporting the Samoan independence group at the time, and he was well into native politics. And there's even some rumours that he was perhaps even gun running for some of the native people on the island. Oh, right. I wow. think he fancied the adventurous lifestyle. Yes. It might be because of it. And one of the nicest things he did, he actually gave his birthday to a girl on the island because her birthday was at an inconvenient time, basically. Oh, right. And he said, you can have you can have my birthday. I actually trained as a barrister, and so I can give you my birthday. And he wrote it out in a nice letter to her. That's pretty cool. I didn't know you could transfer birthdays. Presumably he still celebrated his birthday on his his birthday. They would just celebrate together. Maybe. I mean, Stephen had that power. I'm not sure if everyone has that power, but he definitely mm -hmm. had that power. For as much as he was loved during his life, he actually, after his death, he became seen as a second-class writer, though, didn't he? Gradually being removed from literature that was taught in schools. He also was quite disparaging about some of his own work. When he was writing about Jack and Hyde after it was published, he was like, it's kind of like a penny dreadful. It's not the best. Oh, right. But at the time, it was very well received. But it, it might be the case that subsequently, its appreciation has dropped off. Yeah, it's come back in favour. So there was... Um... A British biographer, Roger Lansling Green, who seemed to um, praise his work at the end of the 20th century, and then he seems to have come back in favour since then. Well, now he's one of the most popular writers of all time, something in the top, in the top 50. So it just shows he's very versatile. And actually, out of all these three writers we're discussing, I think he is my favourite, mainly because I have actually read some of his work in some kind of depth. I've got to say, I'm not normally uh, diving into <laughs> Waverley before bedtime. No, me neither. No, or even Robert Burns. I haven't, I can't say I've read every single one of his poems. 
although I don't deny that they're very good. Robert Burns was creating a lot of lot of work that's very hard to, I think, actually read everything that he created. Well, let's let's talk about Burns. Let's. We haven't really touched on him yet, and he is the third of the three writers represented in the Writers' Museum. Yeah. So, Robert Burns, Scotland's national bard, poet. Is a, we have a whole day to celebrate Burns in indeed. January, where we toast a haggis, have a wee dance, drink whiskey, all those things, in any which order you like. He was born January 25th, 1759, in Alloway, and he died on the 21st of July, 1796, in Dumfries. So he was very much a man of the south-west of Scotland, but he did have a lot of his time in Edinburgh. He moved to Edinburgh when he was quite a young man. After all, he did only live until his late thirties. And it, it was touch and go at one point. He was very close to moving to Jamaica. He was indeed. Yeah. To escape from his first, first wife's family. <laughs> that was one of the rumors <laughs> because he, um, yeah, he certainly liked a woman's attention. He, that's one way to put it. Whether or not he was married. He ha what was it? Did he have nine children with his first wife? Yes, nine children. Well, she bore nine children. Not all of them survived to adulthood. I think only three of them survived to adulthood. And then he had one child with three more. Was it three or four more children he had? It depends who you talk to. The number of the collective number of children he has changes. Yes, anywhere between eleven and fourteen. Yes. Let's take an average, let's say about 12 and a half. Yes, <laughs> which is a lot of children. Weren't you saying that there was something like it has 900 descendants today? Yes, yeah, so because of the 12 or so children that he had during his life, there are now 900 descendants of Burns throughout the world. Well, I don't know whether throughout the world, actually, I presume. I don't know how many of them are still Scotland-based. You haven't asked them all where all they are. No, I haven't asked them all. I don't, I haven't managed to find them all yet. I did read that a famous American designer claims he's a direct descendant of Burns, so we know at least one other person okay. who isn't in Scotland. Across the pond. Yeah. yeah. Probably not very many in Samoa where Stevenson ended up, but who's to say? <laughs> very likely. And like Stevenson and Scott, of course, we have loads of stuff about Burns in the collection. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, we don't have any of his hair, which is unusual because we seem oh. to have everyone else's hair. Yeah, that makes me a bit sad that we don't have any Burns hair. Yeah, but we do have a plaster cast of his skull. Oh, yes, we do. Yes. Which was found to be larger than the average man's skull. Oh. He had such a big head for poems. <laughs> he did. Maybe that's how he could produce so much work. Yeah, so fit it in somewhere. It's all yeah. stored in his noggin. Yeah. We do also have his writing desk, uh -huh. and perhaps most importantly, we have a bottle of Coca-Cola, which was made to mark his 250th birthday. Of course. Burns, Coca-Cola. Burns, Coca-Cola. He, I mean, if he'd lived to the age of 250, yeah, sure. he'd be always yes. on the Coca-Cola. <laughs> We're not being sponsored by Coca-Cola. <laughs> so we have that in the collection centre, so that's not currently on public display. It can also be seen on the tour of the collection centre. Which are available to sign up through through our website. Once everything's back to normal, whenever that may be. Burns, like our other two writers, was fond of his dogs. He was indeed. He loved his dogs. His dog, um, Lua, probably the most famous of his dogs, is a border collie. Yep. And actually means swift or nimble. Oh, I didn't know that. Probably quite apt for a border collie. They tend to move around pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Both Burns and Lua were pretty much inseparable. And actually, it was down to Lua that he married Jean Armour because um, supposedly Lua tried to steal her laundry one day and this interaction between the two gave Burns the courage to then go up to Jean Armour and actually speak to her. And then, what do you know? I didn't know that. Then, so the dog is responsible for a fair few hundred descendants. Yes, yeah. Yes, you could say that. He's got a lot to answer for. Yeah, the dog started it all, yeah. I heard that the name Luaf also comes from one of Ossian's poems. Yeah. The historic uh, writer, poet, and it comes from his poem, Fingal. Ah. Uh, that's where the, the name originally comes from, uh -huh. but not what it means, as you said. And Burns commemorated him in his famous poem, Chua Dogs, which you will now recite for the podcast. I don't think we've got time. And there is a representation of Chua Dogs in the Writers' Museum, 
because yeah. we have a, a lantern slide. So my understanding is that a lantern slide would go over a lantern, be it a gas or candle, and it would make shapes on the wall. I see. So in a way, a lantern slide was a precursor to the cinema because it would be a form of entertainment people could enjoy in crowds and they could see images on, on a wall. Ah. And we have lots of lantern slides in the collection uh -huh. which commemorate different or mark different parts of Burns poems. And on this lantern slide is a scene from Twa Dogs the Poem. But it's interesting because Burns features a lot of animals in his poems. Uh -huh. So it wasn't just his dog, Lua, which was mentioned. He also had, of course, a poem to a louse, to a louse, and to a woodlark as well, so to a bird. And amongst amongst others, they're just to pick a few. It's quite a range of animals there, especially the louse. Yeah, I wouldn't think of writing a poem to a louse normally. No, no. Although I did see one on my bathroom floor this morning, and I wasn't, I wasn't overjoyed to think this is my opportunity to shine. <laughs> it could be that Burns loved talking about animals and his dog because he was at heart a farmer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unlike the other two writers, he wasn't really a city person. And I also read that he was inspired by his poem to a mouse because he had disturbed a mouse nest when he was plowing oh, really? one of his fields. Oh, right. Well, he wasn't really a good farmer, was he, throughout his life? He tended to pick farms that weren't the best land-wise. Other farmers had just would immediately disregard them because they weren't good land, whereas he would choose to farm on them, which probably... Probably didn't help him. No, definitely not. I think that's why he was originally considering the move to Jamaica as well. He wanted to make some cash money. That was his. He did, but it wasn't a very well-paid job anyway to go onto the sugar plantation, wasn't it? No, I don't think it would have made him an absolute fortune, but... No. Of course, it would have also got him away from those uh, relatives of his first wife <laughs> who didn't really like him. Going back to it that. indeed. Split motives. Yeah. It's a hard truth to reconcile with the Burns. We know he wasn't afraid to challenge accepted social norms he found distasteful. He hated hypocrisy and cruelty and championed kindness and fairness. However, the role of bookkeeper or overseer of slaves, which he was offered by a friend and which meant he probably would have very likely been involved in the sale of slaves, was an option that he considered in hard times, both financially and in his family life. Thankfully, his written work gained popularity in Edinburgh and so he never actually went to Jamaica and he created such works as The Slave's Lament, which was written from the viewpoint of a slave and the hardships they felt and shares his viewpoints on egalitarianism. Yeah, he made his money from his first work of poetry, so he didn't have to go to Jamaica. Just in the nick of time. Yes. So there is a monument to Burns um, in Edinburgh on the famous Colton Hill. It looks out over Arthur's seat, but also the Cannon Gate graveyard. And inside that monument there used to be a statue, didn't there? Yeah. Of Burns. They did. But it wasn't doing too well in the monument. It was suffering. Yeah. Some nearby gas works were affected. The, I think it's affected the integrity of the marble in the statue. Yeah, so it was getting a lot of soot on top of it. Yeah, which wouldn't do anyone any good. No, and so it was moved. You couldn't stand in front of the gas works all your life. No, and it wasn't moved until 1839 when it actually came into the um, ownership of the city of Edinburgh and funnily enough was removed and is now on display at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. But it's still maintained by us, Edinburgh City or is a museum, so our conservator has to go into the National Portrait Gallery to check on check on Burns, see how he's doing. I mean it is it is in a very nice great hall. Oh yeah. It's in a very nice area. He's well looked after. Yes, he is. So I did also read that he's the third most sculpted person in the world. Oh, is that right? After Queen Victoria. Oh, of course. And your friend of mine, Christopher Columbus. <laughs> I did not know that. That's interesting. And um, do you want to take a guess at where the oldest sculpture of Burns is? In Ayrshire? No, it's not even in Europe. Oh! It's in a place called Camperdown in Australia. Oh! Yes, he does have quite a few monuments to him scattered across the world. Well, he's the third most sculpted person, so he definitely got around. Yeah, definitely. This sculpture in Australia dates back to the 1830s, so it's pretty old. Uh-huh. So on Bernard Street in Leith, there is another statue of Burns, which incidentally is the only statue of Burns in Edinburgh, which is actually outside, commissioned by the Leith Burns Club in 1897 and designed by 
David Watson Stevenson. It's sculpted in bronze and cast at the foundry of J.W. Singer and Sons. So was that made in Edinburgh? Yes. Oh, okay. So like the two other statues of our writers, who are all made in Edinburgh as well. Yeah, we're very good at creating statues. Good at making statues. Yeah. Incidentally, this um, statue has been moved very recently, actually December last year, because of the new tram system that we are currently putting in. Um, and a time capsule was found inside that was placed originally within the statue when it was built in 1898 but then again was opened and added to in 1961. So when we opened it, we found that there were newspapers in it, coins, there was a pamphlet including information of the crimes investigated within Edinburgh in 1897, and a leaflet of the rules of the constitution of the Leith Burns Club who um, commissioned the statue. And later on, more information was added. It's a shame that the crimes weren't from a bit earlier on, because then obviously it would feature the snowball crime <laughs> we were talking about earlier on probably the most heinous of crimes exactly um so the idea when when this statue is put back after the trams are in place that we museums galleries and algebra would create our own time capsule and put the original time capsule and our time capsule back with the statue once it goes back into its original place and then once it's all dug up again a few more years we'll add a third time capsule yeah and we'll just keep adding more and more time capsules yeah who knows i mean it has moved a few times during its life by only a small amount again mm. to make way for a better traffic flow so who knows maybe there'll be more more, more trams to come in the future and we'll need to move it again. Trams here, there and everywhere and statues of Burns left, right and centre. Exactly. Now, all these writers have really interesting histories. We have so much on them as a, there is quite a lot to see as well. And it's fantastic that once lockdown is over we can go and celebrate them and see their works and their items associated with their life in the Writers Museum. And in the meantime of course we can always enjoy what they produced in their, their books and also on Capital Collections, yes. which showcases items from the collection on the internet. You can't not get involved. You can't not. You heard it here first. And that is it for another podcast. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed hearing about our three giants of Scottish literature. If you'd like to hear more about our work, head to edinburghmuseums.org.uk or follow us at edinculture on Twitter for more updates. Stay safe, and maybe whilst we're all spending so much time indoors, you could spend some time reading some of the works by Scott, Stevenson or Burns.